On August 21st, something really exciting is going to happen in the US, a total solar eclipse. This is what happens when the moon passes in front of the sun and it's going to cast a shadow that travels across the United States. all the way from the Oregon coast to South Carolina. But wait, the moon rises in the east and sets in the west. Why is the shadow moving from west to east? This is actually a really big question and even astrophysicists sometimes have trouble answering it. Clearly, we need to consult an expert on this. So we went to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland to talk to Alex Young, a NASA scientist, and ask for his best explanation. To try to make it as simple as possible, it really boils down to how fast the Earth is spinning and how fast the Moon is orbiting around it. The Moon is orbiting about twice as fast as this, the Earth is spinning. The Moon is orbiting about twice as fast as this, the Earth is spinning. Now this is the main thrust of this video. But all of you who want to be brain dead for whatever reason, here you have a high level scientist from NASA, Goddard Space Center in Maryland, tell you directly that the moon is orbiting twice as fast as the Earth is spinning. The moon is moving twice as fast as the Earth is spinning. Correct? Isn't that what he just said? That means, think about this. That means the moon should rise and set two times for every time the sun rises and sets. It's moving twice as fast as the earth is spinning, right? It's orbiting twice as fast. That means you would, whenever you see the moon in the sky, it should be moving twice as fast across the sky as the sun. What causes the sun to move across the sky according to their model? the speed of the rotation of the earth. So if the moon is going twice as fast as that, then it should loop the sun. It should lap the sun, I should say. It should lap the sun once every day. There's no way around this, people. This is what he's telling you. Why is he telling you this? Because this is the only way to explain the eclipse. It's the only way to explain why the shadow moves from west to east. The moon has to move twice as fast as the earth spins. Now I'm going to let you hear it one more time and then let it continue. The moon is orbiting about twice as fast as this, the earth is spinning. So if we're looking down on the earth and we're at the moon, we see the earth spinning, but the moon is moving faster. And so that shadow is moving across the Earth this way, which is west to east. Simple, right? Don't worry. Over the next few months, we'll be answering a lot of questions about the eclipse. Well, they won't be answering correctly if they answer like they did this time. You know, back in the day, they used to have actually uh, what they called science editors at TV and, and um, newspapers where they would actually have people that were educated in science so that they could go back and forth with so-called science experts and ask them things. Now the people are so dumbed down that this woman just accepted this, or the Washington Post compost, just accepted this as the correct answer without doing any kind of research, obviously. Nowhere does science ever claim that the moon is going faster than the Earth. In fact, the model falls apart if it does. So let's get on to what I want to talk about in this video. We're going to shift gears big time now. Now let's look at something here before we go on. A little bit of a review, okay guys? When you get into different classes in college and different things like that, and you're trying to study the model that they want to present to you, everything is presented with 90 degree angle, rays coming from the sun to the earth. This has to be geometry forces nearly 90 degree perpendicular sun rays striking the earth all the time. 
when you get into these kind of things, you're going to do things uh, like computing angle of incidence, whereas like in the Tropic of Cancer in the summer, on the first day of summer at 23.5 degrees north, your angle of incidence of the sun's rays is zero. How do you get that? Because the sun is directly above 23.5 degrees north. If you're on that line, 23.5 degrees north, your angle of incidence is said to be zero. Why? Because you have perpendicular sun rays at that point on the earth, meaning they're striking at 90 degrees. All kind of different things are computed and done with this thing, guys. I'm not getting into it right now deeply, but all kind of things in science fall apart if these sun rays ever do not strike the earth at 90 degrees. The seasons get messed up for one big time. This is their model. You have to have this be this way. Otherwise it falls apart. How many pictures do I have to show you in textbooks and others that show you that the sun rays are coming in at 90 degrees and that the seasons like up here, it's cooler because of the angle of the earth is tilted away. That's why they say it's colder up here than down here. But as you notice, no matter where you are, the, the rays are coming in perpendicular. You have to calculate this when you're in these classes and come up with your angle of incidence and things like that. This is what makes their model tick and work. Here's another one. Ask yourself, are these coming in at 90 degrees no matter where you are on the earth? If all of a sudden one crossed, wouldn't that screw it up? How could you have ever figure out your angle of incidence anywhere on the earth if they came in any other way other than 90 degrees? You could not do it. Here's another one. One more. There you go. They're all coming in. All right. Oh. Near the equator, the sun's rays hit directly. That's only possible if they're coming in at 90 degrees. Otherwise, you could have them hit directly up here because they're coming in at all kind of angles. Correct? So why do we have this? Why do we have this? We have this because their model falls apart when it comes to eclipses. The lie is exposed. These are not coming in at 90 degree angles. Does that look like 90 degree angles to you? Do I have to put 90 degree angles coming off here so you can see it? I, I hope you can see these are not 90 degree angles. Hell, they have this converging at the earth or just past the surface of the earth. Now, why are they doing this? They're doing this because they have a problem. Let's shift gears for a second. Let's talk about shadows, shall we? Let's look at this. A shadow. This is a fundamental role of shadows. It doesn't matter if it's sunlight or if it's light coming from a flashlight or from a fire or from the moonlight or even from Venus. Venus and Jupiter sometimes are bright enough to where they can call shadows. It doesn't matter what the light source is, guys. A shadow of an object is never smaller than the object. It can be the same size as the object, but it can never be smaller. It can be larger than the object. So let's recap that again. The size of an object's shadow can only be the same size as the object or longer. If you don't believe this, the next time you're outside, it doesn't matter what the sun angle is, lift up your shoe. You will see that when you are close to the ground, that the um, shadow is about the same size as your shoe. The farther away you get or the lower the angle of incidence, the larger the shadow will be. It's never sh smaller than the size of the shadow. It cannot be. This is a fundam fundamental rule of light. It's just like water will boil at one standard pressure at 100 degrees Celsius. It will happen every time. There is no exceptions to the rule except science makes one because they can't explain the eclipse just like they can't get the speed of the moon right. Let me show you something here. Here we're looking at sun coming down through the clouds and causing a shadow. Now the shadows are larger than the clouds themselves. You might say, no, they're not. They're the same size, but they're larger. Look at these little, two little small puffy clouds here. Look how big the shadow is on the ground. The, what they're showing here with the arrows is how you can tell where the sunlight is coming from. There's another thing we're going to get into with diffusion, not in this video, 
but the further away the light source is from the object, the more diffuse the shadow is. You would not have a sharp shadow. The moon in the lunar eclipse, if the moon is causing the shadow, it's very sharp, isn't it? Yes, it is. That's how they show it. That's how we see it. Anyway, here's the clouds. Let me show you another, one more example. Here's the same thing we're seeing, except in diagram form. The shadow of the object cannot be smaller than the object itself. Can you see that? It's impossible. So if you wanted to measure this shadow right here, that is, see, no matter where you are here, if you're at this point on the ground or at this point on the ground or in between, the sunlight is completely blocked out. As soon as you leave this shadow, you start seeing the sun again, correct? Same thing works with the eclipse. How big is this cloud? Well, if you measure the distance from here to here to find out how wide the cloud was, you could say, well, let's just say this was 50 feet. You could say the cloud was 50 feet wide or less. It cannot be more because the shadow is always the same size as the object or larger. Make sense? Okay. So let's take a look at that. Remember, keep that in mind. The shadow is the same size or larger than the object, which means the object blocking the sunlight has to be the same size or smaller than the shadow. So if it's 50 feet across what we measure here, the cloud can no bigger be than 50 feet. It can be smaller, but it cannot be larger than 50 feet. Make sense? This is physics. You cannot break this rule. Okay, guys, here we are at space.com. And we're going to look and see what science says about the moon. Alrighty, can we do that? Yeah, let's do that. Here's what I'm interested in right here. The, moon, the moon's mean radius is 1,079.6 miles or 1,737.5 kilometers. Double those figures to get its diameter, 2,159.2 miles. The moon's equatorial circumference is 6,783.5 miles. So, what we want here is we want the diameter. The diameter would be the distance across from here to here. And the same from here down to the bottom, correct? How far wide apart is it? This should tell us how wide the shadow Okay, on the Earth should be cast by this. How can we tell? So, the diameter is 2,159 miles. We'll knock off the point too. 2,159 miles across. So, we should have a 2,159 mile wide total eclipse. Or wider. Correct? Because the shadow can only be larger than or the same size as the object blocking the light source. So the moon should be 2,159.2 miles across. This is according to science. This is according to the laws of light. And in this case, the light is striking at 90 degrees. So it actually should be the exact same size as the object, no larger. So it should be 2,159.2 miles is the path of totality on the earth during the solar eclipse. So let's take a look and see what we're going to come up with on the eclipse day. Guys, we are going to eat this eclipse for breakfast, lunch, dinner, brunch, snacks. This is totally going to blow away the globe model when we get done with this. This is already going to do it right here. You see this path, guys? This is about 70 miles across. 70 miles across. So, according to this, and according to the laws of science and the physics of light and shadow, the moon can be no bigger than 70 miles across. Because the shadow has to be the same size or larger than the object. Has to be. But, guess what? Because it's not, they come up with this bullcrap right here. That's why they come up with this lie. This is why the only time in the history of the world 
that sun rays do not come off at 90 degrees and strike the earth as during eclipses. So we have a problem here, don't we? Yes, we do. All of a sudden, physics once again ceases to work. Not only do we have the moon that should lap the sun twice a day, moving twice as fast this way, and it doesn't. The moon actually loses against the sun each day. We'll get into that in another video. But we've only got a 70 mile wide shadow, period. That means the moon, according to science, according to the physics of light, can be no longer, no wider than 70 miles. So we're a little over 2,000 miles off science is on the size of the moon. So we're left with a couple of perplexing questions. Since the laws of physics cannot change, and of course they say they do with astronomical units for whatever reason, uh, but it doesn't change when astronomical units are striking the, uh, an airplane in the sky or clouds or whatever. It always holds true, no matter what. So either the moon is 70 miles away or something else is getting in front of the sun. That's the only two options I can think of. Again, how long are you going to allow yourself to belittle your own intelligence if you want to hang on to this? Can't you see they're lying to you? We've just covered two things that are wrong right here. We've got Goddard Space Center experts. And guys, that's where the rocket scientists really exist. They're not down at NASA in, in uh, Florida. They're in Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland and other places like that. That's where the brain trust hangs out. And this guy is saying the moon is traveling twice as fast as the Earth spins, which means we'd have to see it rise and set twice as fast as we see the sun rise and set. No? Tell me how I'm wrong. Tell me how I'm wrong here with the shadows. That's all, guys, for this video. Take care. God bless each and every one of you.